I thought the best place to start was with one of your personality traits. When I mm. watch you online, when I listen to your <laughs> podcasts, one of the most endearing things is that you believe that every single person has the ability to achieve their dreams. Is that realistic? Mm. Yeah, if they believe they are worthy and deserving of achieving it, and if they're willing to do what it takes. So I believe it's possible, but that needs to happen within each person. And so I see people as a masterpiece, and usually they don't see that in themselves. And I, I learned to see that in others because I struggled with the same problem for many years. I was very insecure, very unsure of myself, uncertain, didn't have peace in my heart, felt unsafe in the world, and just was like confused of who I am. And I think a lot of us experience that at different times. And that's been a lifelong journey of, of kind of overcoming insecurity, self-doubt, and learning to believe in all the parts of me, even the parts of me that I'm the most shamed of or the most afraid of or have pain around. And so learning to accept those things within me, accepting my past and being at peace with it, um, not saying I have to like all these things that have happened in the past, but accepting it and being at peace with it, it gives me permission to pursue things with a whole heart. Now, some people may look at you, Lewis, and go, hey, I get it for you, right? You are a successful sportsman. You host one of the most listened to podcasts on the planet. You're successful, right? What has your success got to do with me and my life? I've got struggles. I've got insecurities. Mm -hmm. I've got fears. Why is your story relevant for that person? Mm. I just think I can relate to a lot of people who struggle. Um, because I struggled so much. I mean, I I grew up, you know, in a, in a household when I when I was eight. My brother went away to prison for four and a half years, and so growing up in a small town, um, the, I just didn't know anyone who went to prison. And and here, my brother went to prison, and so I wasn't allowed to have friends for four and a half years. And I went to go visit a a, a prison visiting room uh, on the weekends with my family for four and a half years. So it was a very confusing, sad, challenging time. When I was five, you know, I experienced, I've talked about this many times, but I experienced sexual abuse when I was five. It's one of my first memories as a human being was being sexually abused by a man that I didn't know. And, and so that was confusing, scary, you know, uncertain. I felt abused. I felt taken advantage of all these different things. And then I was also just in the bottom of my class in school. So I was always in the bottom four. They used to rank us in our grade cards. I don't know if they did this in the UK, but they would, every semester you'd get a, your grade card and then they'd tell you what ranking you are with all your classmates. So I was always in the bottom four in the special needs classes and just struggled in school. So I just felt very insecure, like I had no value, no worth in school. And I thought I was dumb my entire life. And... Um, the one thing that I did have ability in, that I trained myself for, that I dedicated my life to was sports because I wasn't good in school. I said, I'm gonna take all this aggression and energy after school into the sports field and the sports courts and um, to pursue a dream. And I did pretty well. And I got to the professional level in professional football in America, but I got injured in my rookie season. I broke my wrist and was in a cast for six months. So my identity, you know, I don't have my dream anymore. I don't have the thing that I'm skilled at anymore to do, to have value to my life. And at that time, it was 2008, 2009, when the economy was crashing in the US. And I didn't have a college degree yet. I had left early to go play uh, football. And so for a year and a half, I'm on my sister's couch with no money, credit card debt, no job, no opportunities, trying to figure out, you know, what I'm gonna do now. And so I can, I feel like I can understand the feeling of being stuck, the feeling of being lonely which is what I felt for a long time. The feeling of not being good enough, not you know being afraid that you don't have the skills necessary to uh, make money or to get a job or to start something. I didn't have the confidence in myself for many years after that happened. And it took me going on a journey of really saying, okay, uh, these things that make me feel powerless, these fears, these insecurities, these doubts that make me feel powerless they need to become my mission. They need to become the journey that I go on. And so I started, I literally around 23 years old, created a fear list 
when I was sleeping on my sister's couch, I wrote down all the things that made me feel the most insecure, the most worthless, and the things that I was afraid to do. Um, and public speaking was one of them. Learning to salsa dance was another one. I'm happy to tell that story why that. Uh, singing in public, um, you know, starting a business, all these things, writing a book, these things were all scary because I didn't think I could do them. And I didn't think I had the skills or the experience or the wisdom to be able to do them. And I just said, one by one, I'm going to go all in and train like an athlete in these fears and insecurities until these fears no longer consume or control me from taking action, from having courage. And by doing that one by one on that fear list, it, it allowed me to start feeling this incredible confidence in myself because I was doing the things that were so scary to me and I was getting pretty good at them. It wasn't like mm-hmm. I, you know, just did it so I wasn't afraid anymore. I actually became great at public speaking to where I get paid a lot of money now, where I could not speak in front of three people without stuttering and stumbling 15 years ago. But by practicing every week, humiliating myself for many, many months until I learned how to fumble my way into it, I started to get better. Same yeah. thing with salsa dancing. You know, I, I could not dance to save my life. I don't know about you, Rangan, but for me as a you know, a white boy from the Midwest, salsa dancing is not in our vocabulary or in our culture. It wasn't something we did, salsa dancing. Um, and I looked completely out of place when I would enter a dance floor with a bunch of Latinos and Spanish speaking music and people speaking Spanish everywhere. I'm like, ah, what is going on? But that uncomfortableness, that insecurity, that fear that I don't fit in, I don't belong. I, I'm not accepted here. I don't, I'm not supposed to be here. That taking on that action and humiliating myself for many months. Again, I'm not good right away, humiliating myself and and feeling out of place, but overcoming it after six months and then learning how to really actually be pretty pretty decent and decent enough to be able to dance with top people around the world over the last 15 years has given me incredible confidence and belief in myself. So for people that are doubting themselves or feel like they're stuck or they're not sure where they're, they're heading or they feel like, oh, I'm just not getting a break or an opportunity, I felt that way for a long time because a year and a half, that happened to me. I was stuck on the couch, no money, didn't feel like any opportunities were falling my way. And that's why I had to go make the opportunities yeah. by writing down my fears and insecurities and going all in on them. Yeah, it's really, really powerful. There's so much there, Lewis, isn't there? There's, you know, you leaning into... Your fear of public speaking, leading into your fear of salsa dancing, the imposter syndrome. I mean, these are universal experiences. You've experienced them, I've experienced them. Pretty much everyone listening or watching this show right now has or is currently experiencing them. Yet, from the outside at least, Lewis, you seem to have beautifully overcome them to really make a success of your life, you definitely come across as someone who feels very calm and content and at peace with themselves, which is very magnetic when you see someone like that and hear someone like that speak. But no one would blame you, Lewis, Mm. if you hadn't got here. You've shared, I know, about the sexual abuse you Mm -hmm. experienced when you were five years old. And I don't claim at all to know what that must feel like to go through that, to have that imprinted within your body, Mm -hmm. within your mind for so many years, the shame, the secrecy. I know you've spoken about that. I think we should unpack some of it here because I think it's very, very relevant. But nobody would have blamed you, Lewis, if you hadn't made something of your life. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you'd struggle to say, yeah, this happened to me. Yeah, you've made a conscious decision to not let that hold you back, haven't you? 100%. I mean, I I didn't want anything to hold me back, but things were holding me back for a long time. You know, in the beginning, that pain and that shame and that anger and resentment and that feeling of not being enough, not being worthy enough, it drove me to achieve success in sports and then eventually in business. It drove me. It was the fuel that said, I'm going to prove people wrong. I'm going to... Uh, you know, get back at all the doubters, anyone that criticized me, I'm going to show them. And I'm also going to get so, you know, successful that no one can mess with me. It's essentially a defense mechanism to protect ourselves when something like abuse or abandonment or 
any type of big trauma, little trauma happens, we have different defense mechanisms. We wear masks. Some of those masks drive us to be effective, efficient, or workaholics. And other times it, it makes us shut down or makes us shrink. It makes us uh, overeat. It makes us overindulge uh, or get new addictions to cope, to deal with the pain and numb the pain of I'm not enough. I'm not lovable. I'm not accepted. I'll never be good enough. This feeling that can be crippling. And I had kind of both of them. I had, you know, things that made me feel like I'm shrinking to numb the pain and other things that drove me to be more successful. And every time I would accomplish success in sports or business, I remember never feeling good enough still. I, never, I still yeah. was like kind of angry and resentful after I'd accomplished big goals and big dreams after years of hard work. And, I, and 20 minutes after it would happen, I just wasn't that happy. And I was wondering why. And so I was just like, well, maybe it's not big enough. I need bigger goals yeah. and bigger dreams. And that would happen for years. And I was just like, okay, I just got to keep going for more and more and more. And this fuel that was pushing me to run away from my past, essentially, to, to not talk about the past, to numb it, to uh, you know push that pain as far back behind me as I could, it just kept coming after me. It wasn't until I turned around and faced it and started to really look at it and really have a conversation in a weird way with myself who was still wounded as a five-year-old, who was still traumatized as an eight-year-old, who was still confused as a teenage boy going through puberty and dealing with breakups and mm -hmm. heartaches, who was sad at 22, breaking my wrist and losing my identity. When I never faced these things, I actually finally turned around and faced those painful memories and painful moments and painful experiences. Because I don't know if this is the same way for you as a man in the UK growing up, the culture for me growing up in America was never to talk about your shame, your challenges, your pain, your past, yeah. your heartaches. It was to rub dirt on the wound, wipe your hands off and keep moving forward. Yeah. It's not to talk about it because when you talked about, you showed any emotion in school or in sports, it was almost like you were laughed at, made fun of, picked on, pushed out of the, the friend circle and a little bit bullied. And so as kids, we want to be accepted. We want to fit in. We want to belong. And so we we mold and mimic to be able to be safe in a friend group or a sports team or whatever, yeah. our social circle. So I never felt, and I don't blame these kids. We're all just trying to figure it out. But I, I never felt safe to communicate how I truly felt. And imagine going your whole life without feeling safe internally. It's going to do things to your health. As you know, as a doctor, it's going to hurt your health when you're constantly in chronic stress, chronic yeah. anxiety, chronic uh, rumination, chronic self-criticism. It's going to affect your nervous system. It's going to affect your, your, your chemical makeup. It's going to affect your brain, your heart, your yeah. emotions, and everything. And it's going to affect the way you see the world. And we're going to respond and react in certain ways that are not as useful to our inner peace, to our harmony, and to our greatness. Yeah. When we live in a state of trauma from the past, when we hold on to it, when we're unable to reveal it in a safe way. And so for me, I've had to learn how to unwire and unwind a lot of that, those lessons and that way of thinking and, and yeah. living and it started, the, the process started 10 years ago when I started the School of Greatness show. I was like, man, my, I'm accomplishing all this success. I'm making money. I've got awards and accolades. Uh, you know, I'm building a following. But why is every relationship in my life breaking down? Why is this business partnership I had breaking down? Why is this intimate relationship not working? Why am I reactive in life? Why am I triggered so easily? Why when someone can like push a button on my in my wounds, I just ah, I react. Yeah. Why is that? And I realized I was the common denominator in every one of these relationships. So there had to be something where I needed to finally take a look at. But in my 20s, I thought like, you know, I have it figured out and there's nothing wrong with me and don't judge me and don't criticize me. You know, I had to protect myself because I was so insecure. Yeah. I was so, I lacked confidence. I was wounded. I was a wounded little boy inside of a man's body still. Yeah. And it wasn't until 10 years ago when I, I started the journey of healing. And it's been a constant journey. It's been up and down. It's not like this perfect straight line of getting yeah. to 
healing and wholeness or whatever we're trying to get to, but it's it's been a beautiful journey of learning, then applying what I learn, trying stuff, you know, having growth, making some mistakes, relearning stuff to get to the point where I'm at now. Yeah, so powerful, especially someone as successful as you, Lewis, sharing things like this, uh, being a man. I think it's very, very powerful. A lot of things you've shared over the years about your own journey. You mentioned what was it like for me growing up in the UK. I think it's very similar. Men mm -hmm. don't really share stuff like this. You just get on with it. I think this is why I'm so drawn to your story, because I know you talk a lot about shame and secrecy and how when you open up, the story no longer has the power over you. We don't realize, do we, how much these stories get wired in as children. And then as adults, we're unconsciously just playing out this wiring that we didn't even know was in there. And my dad's whole philosophy coming to the UK, Lewis, was when there's racism, when there's discrimination, you don't mention anything, you just put your head down, you get on with it. You put your head down and you get on with it. You don't cause a fuss. So I absorb that. Yeah, I mean, anytime there is a shame that we have or a frustration or a hurt and we don't address it, it stays with us yeah. in some way. So if you put your head down and you keep moving forward, you'll keep getting results, but it doesn't mean that thing's going to go away. It's going to keep like popping up and kind of nagging at you every once in a while. It's just going to be a reminder or you see something unjust in the future and it's going to remind you of that thing that you haven't addressed yet. And so I definitely resonate with it because for 25 years, almost every day I thought about the moment I was sexually abused. I tried to erase it. I tried to put it away. I tried to just put my head down and keep moving forward and having fun as a kid or whatever, but it really affected me. And, and as an adult, it affected me as well because as I, my, my brain started to mature and I started to learn more, um, and I realized, oh, wow, this was actually something that was not okay mm -hmm. in a major way. And I had to keep facing it. I had to keep like thinking about it and realizing, oh, wow, this is, you know, this is frustrating, but let me not talk about it because I'm so ashamed of it. Let me not unpack it because it's so hurtful, it's so painful. And that, that drove me. Again, I, I just focused. I worked hard. I did all the right things, I guess, but it still, it drove me from a wound, from a pain. And it wasn't until I was, it took me 25 years until I started to open up about it. This was 10 years ago. And um, it was one of the scariest things for me to kind of open up about that um, because I thought if people knew this about me, this shame, this this insecurity I had, this this experience that I, that I went through, that no one would like me, no one would accept me, no one would love me. And I'd be unlovable for the rest of my life. That was the story that I kept telling myself because at the time, 10 years ago, I'd never seen, uh, specifically, I'd never seen athletes or businessmen talk about ever being sexually abused or anything like that. It was never talked about in culture, on TV. I never saw articles about this anywhere. It's just people didn't talk about it. And I think there's been in the last, you know, five, seven years, more men opening up about just mental health challenges, depression, sexual abuse, different challenges they've gone through, and they're starting to open up about it. And you're seeing them create freedom and peace in their heart when they process it, when they reveal it. I think it's just a cultural thing. My previous book, The Mask of Masculinity, I would go around and do a tour, and I'd have rooms of about 50% men and women in the book tour. And say there's 500 people in the room, and I would ask the women in the room, I'd say, raise your hand if once a week you get together with a girlfriend, girlfriends, your mom, your sister, and you talk about your insecurities, your pain, your problems, your challenges, maybe your body issues that you're dealing with, your relationship challenges. If you do this once a week with a girlfriend or girlfriends, almost every hand, and I say, keep your hands up, ladies, if you do this pretty much every day. You're on the phone with a girlfriend, you're having lunch, tea, coffee, and you're talking about it. Almost all of them left, kept their hands up and kind of laughed, right? And I said, okay, for the men in the room, raise your hand if once a month you get together with another male friend, once a month, and you talk about your insecurities, your body issues, your fears, your shames, your doubts, uh, your relationship issues. Raise your hand if you do this once a month. And there'd typically be one or two guys in the room that would raise their hand out of hundreds. And I'd say, kind of jokingly, 
Are you guys part of a almost mandatory church group that gets together as a men's group and does this? Yeah. And they all kind of laugh. They're like, yeah. And I say, okay, men, raise your hand if you get together once a year with a guy friend or guy friends and talk about this. And again, only a couple hands would go up. And I'd talk to the ladies. I'd go back to the ladies and I'd say, ladies, what would it feel like if you only got to share what you were dealing with once a month? And you only had one moment once a month to talk about it. How would it make you feel? They were like, I would feel like I'm going crazy. I'd be like holding it, bottling in all these energy. I couldn't, I wouldn't, I'd just be going crazy. I couldn't do it. And I say, what would it feel like if you could only do it once a year? And they're like, there's no way. There's no way. It's not possible. And I say, imagine a lifetime never talking about these things. What would you do? And ladies would say, you know, I'd probably, I just couldn't live. I'd probably kill myself. Yeah. It'd be unbearable, you know, all these kind of words. And I'm like, well, imagine, again, this is what a lot of men are faced with. And I'm not saying it's every human is responsible for their own feelings and actions. And they, they got to get the courage to talk about these things. But when they're shamed constantly as kids, made fun of, made wrong, it's not a safe environment to have these conversations with guy friends. And they don't feel they can do it with their intimate partners because maybe they're not comfortable you know, opening up yet. It's just a hard thing to do. Yeah. And again, every man is responsible for the actions they make in the world. But when they are feel suffocated, trapped emotionally, and they are unable to communicate or express their feelings in a safe environment without being made wrong and shamed, it's just going to be hard to do. And, um, and when I had that conversation, you know, I feel like those women understood. They're like, wow, I don't know how men do it then. Because I couldn't do, I couldn't go a month without talking about these things, let alone years. And that's why you know the stats, you know, more men commit suicide than women, more men get, go to prison than women. And when men have pain trapped inside of them, it can be a big trauma or little trauma. And it doesn't matter the level of pain or the level of abuse, we still have to process whatever it is yeah. we're experiencing and go through. And if we don't process it, it stays with us and it starts to affect us emotionally. You start to get chest pains. You start to have back pains. You start to get throat closed up. When we suppress our emotions, the body yeah. keeps the score, uh, as the book says. So I think our goal, uh, you know, as all human beings, but men specifically, is to learn how to face the pain and create safe environments for us to heal. Because as you know, and what you see on the news, a lot of the pain caused in the world, the mass shootings, the political unrest, the, the anger in the world comes, a lot of it comes from men. Yeah. And I believe a lot of those men have not healed yet. They have pain, they have wounds inside of them, and therefore they are using that anger to hurt the world or hurt others or hurt their spouses and things like that because of unresolved trauma, because of unresolved pain and a wound that is causing them to react and defend or attack when they feel hurt or under attack. And again, I'm not saying any of this is okay. Any of these actions are not okay. But what I am saying is I can understand where that pain is coming yeah. from because I've experienced a lot of that pain. I know you've experienced it and everyone's experienced it. Yeah. But we must learn to face it and process it in a healthy way if we want to be great. Yeah, it's not excusing the behavior necessarily. It's trying to understand the behavior. Yes. It's trying to get to the root cause of it. And you know, my own journey as a Dr. Lewis has very much ended up currently, you know, 21 years in, that mindset, the way we think about the world, the way we approach the world, that's where it all starts, right? Yes. That's why I love your work. That's why I think the book you've written is so great because a lot of our behaviors, you know, we could talk about food and exercise and mm -hmm. sleep and stress and do all these things. And sure, I'm passionate about that. I've written about it. I'll talk to patients about it. But I've come to the realization that these are usually downstream consequences of the way we view the world, the internal mm -hmm. stress that we carry. This is why I believe many people can't make lifestyle change stick mm, because they're yeah. trying to use willpower and motivation for a few weeks or a few months. But ultimately, the behavior there is serving a much bigger goal. It's helping you numb that yes. emotional pain inside, right? Right. I've experienced this where 
you can work out, do the perfect workouts consistently yeah. every day and train your body. You can eat perfectly. You can eat healthy food perfectly, cut out sugar, gluten, whatever, and eat clean vegetables, lean meat every day, to the, under 2,000 calories a day, and no snacking, no sugar. You can get eight hours of sleep. You can get sunlight in the morning. You can do cold and hot showers. You can do ice baths. You can do saunas. You can do meditation. You can do it all. And you can still suffer and be unhealthy if you don't learn to process the emotional and mental traumas and triggers that cause you to react in unhealthy ways. So you could do all those things and still feel sick and still feel hurt and still be held back and feel unsafe and insecure. And that's why, and I've experienced that because I did all those things. I worked yeah. out, I ate well, I slept well. I, I tried to get eight hours of sleep, all these different things. But when your thoughts are ruminating and you're unable to sleep and your emotions are triggered when someone cuts you off in the street or someone says something about you you don't like and you try to defend yourself, there's something inside of you that is wounded still. Mm -hmm. There was a moment that opened a wound inside of us emotionally that causes us then to react as a, later in life and as adults. And every time we react, it doesn't make us wrong. It's just an awareness that someone pushed a button, an emotional trigger. Where is that a trigger coming from? If that wound never opened in the first place when we are 5, 10, 20, whatever it is, we wouldn't be reactive. Yeah. If we understood how to give that, that wound the time to heal and create different meaning around it. And it's not masking it and just saying, oh, well, I'm just going to have a happy life anyways. That's, that's called a spiritual bypass. That's not really processing the pain authentically. That's just, you know, wiping it away, sweeping it under the rug. That doesn't work either. It's feeling the range of emotions, processing it, and really creating new meaning around it and figuring out how can I solve this in the future so that it doesn't happen? How can I make sure I don't abandon myself, that I speak up the next time, or that I do something or I use a little more courage the next time, or I just remove myself from these situations or whatever it might be so that it's not as hurtful in the future when things happen. Because as you know, remarks, whether they are intentional or unintentional, they're gonna keep happening to me, for whatever is gonna happen to me, for you, for everyone. We're not gonna escape and the world is never gonna be perfect. And yeah. people are gonna do things that are intentionally harmful and unintentionally harmful. It's how we react and respond to them and how we create meaning around those things. As, as I'm sure you've read or you're aware of Man's Search for Meaning, it's one of my favorite books yeah. by Viktor Frankl. Again, here's a man who went through one of the most horrific experiences of life, being in the Holocaust and experiencing death and, and, and in extreme harm around him daily. And yet he lived a life of meaning and purpose and joy and love and peace after he got out. And again, it's about the meaning we place. And it's about, it's about allowing yourself to face it. It's about going back to the place, mentally, emotionally, or physically, facing it, and allowing yourself to find peace and forgiveness in that state. And again, not needing to forgive certain people who have done harm, but forgiving yourself for holding on to the pain. Yeah. Your new book is all about achieving greatness, right? And... You write in the book how greatness only really begins once you decide to heal the pain and trauma mm -hmm. of the past. Yes. And, you know, you've touched on that already throughout this conversation that, you know, you have that typical story, Lewis, where you were in your mm -hmm. 20s, maybe your 30s, you're crushing life on crushing from the outside. People I was were dominating. Thinking, yeah. Lewis Howes <laughs> is a success, right? But there's external success and internal mm -hmm. struggle. And, mm -hmm. you know, I often think about energy these days and what's the energy behind a certain behavior? You know, it's, it's the drive to do well coming from a place of lack. You know, I'm not going to let anyone ever do something to me again. So I'm going to get strong. I'm going to make myself big. I'm going to be a great sportsman, mm -hmm. right? Or is the energy coming from a place of abundance and love where you yes. already feel whole? Because I don't know, when I hear your story, Lewis, I was thinking about Michael Jordan in The Last Dance. What really struck me watching that was that, yes, he was the greatest. You know, he's widely considered, you know, 
possibly, arguably, the greatest basketball player of all time. Certainly one of the greatest, right? And it's seen throughout that documentary that what was pushing him was a feeling of lack, was an internal pain. Mm. And, you know, I often wonder with some of these high performers, and of course, I don't know, you know, his full story. But sometimes I wonder, you know, was the success worth it? Was it mm. worth the cost? On the outside or the accolades, I don't mean with Michael Jordan, I mean with many high performers. A lot of the time we find that the energy driving it is a place of lack, not a place of yes. love and fullness. And you also mm -hmm. had, I think, elements of that story earlier on in your life where you're achieving the success, but the energy behind it isn't one that's going to make you happy and give you that inner peace, is it? Yeah. I mean... It's interesting, when I interviewed Kobe before he passed, I asked him what greatness was to him. And he talked about, you know, being in a place where you give your ultimate best at the thing you're doing so that you inspire others to give their best and then they inspire others to give mm. their best. So it wasn't about like win at all costs. It was about giving your best in the endeavor you're doing but being an inspiration, a symbol of greatness for people in your life or anyone that's a witness of what you're doing so that they want to be a symbol for the people in their life and they want to impact people in their life. It's about the ripple effect. Yeah. And it wasn't about like be number one and win at everything. That's greatness. Um, and an interesting story about Kobe, he told me that his first – summer he did like a summer league of basketball when he was like 12 or 13 and he didn't score one point the entire summer and like every game there was not one time he scored and he mentioned that his his parents said hey we love you either way whether you score every point or no points we still love you and he said them saying that gave him permission to then go out and fail and go out and yeah. try harder and go out and like do it from a place of love as opposed to, I'm not enough, let me go prove I'm enough. And again, there's two different paths. There's the, I'm not enough, let me go get big, fast, strong, and do whatever it takes to win. And then when you win, you might feel enough for a moment until you don't. Because as the late uh, Wayne Dyer used to say, he used to give this analogy, I was a big Wayne Dyer fan, where he would say, when you have an orange and you squeeze the orange, what comes out of the orange is orange juice because that's what's inside the orange. When you squeeze it, orange juice comes out because that's what's inside. When you apply pressure to a human being and you squeeze the human and you put pressure through them and it's adversity, a challenge, life pressures, what comes out of the human is what's inside of the human being. And that might be pain, anger, resentment, mm -hmm. a fear, a drive to be right, uh, make people wrong. And when that's what you see people when there's pressure, you see them react or respond in different ways based on what's inside of them, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Yeah. To make sure you're taking action after watching this video, I have created a free breathing guide that's gonna help you reduce stress, calm your mind and boost your energy. In this guide, I share with you six really simple breathing practices that work immediately. Even just one minute a day will start to make a big difference. To receive your free guides, all you have to do is click on the link in the description box below. And so that's why we must cultivate what's inside of us to be a, an environment of peace, harmony, love, and an environment of a drive from a sustainable energy, which is abundance, yeah. not from fear, insecurity, or lack. And when we can cultivate that more consistently, again, we're all human beings and no one's perfect here, but when we can do that more consistently, we show up better when life happens, when adversity happens, when we have a, a, you know sickness in our family that we're facing and it's fairly sad and it's hard to deal with, when we have a job loss that we're dealing with, a transition, economy crisis, a crash in the market, and we deal with challenges of life, how we react is based on what's inside of us. Yeah. And so that's why we must face the things inside of us, heal, create new meaning around these memories that cause us to hurt ourselves and others so that we can have more peace moving forward. Yeah, really powerful. That orange analogy is fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. What a 
privilege to have interviewed Kobe Bryant uh, before he died. Uh, a really, really powerful conversation. Just a couple of things on that, Lewis, as you were sharing that story. Number one, I love what you said about what his parents said to him, that we don't mind whether you score or you don't score, we still love you. Yes. And as a parent myself, I've been a dad now for 12 years. As someone, and I've shared this story in my last book and, and many times on the show, as, as, as a child who really felt, again, I'm not putting blame on my parents this, but mm -hmm. I, for whatever reason, took on the belief that I was only loved when I was top of the class, when mm -hmm. I had full marks, when I was the straight A student, right? So I took that belief into adulthood and it has caused me a lot of problems for sure. <laughs> a lot of internal pain. Yes, on the outside, it's driven a lot of success. Results. Yeah, yeah but at a huge internal cost, again, I feel I've repaired a lot of that now and I, yeah. I really do feel the sense of calmness and contentment. But as a parent, because often as parents, we try to overcorrect. You know, we perceive mm -hmm. what happened to us and go, right, that's not going to happen to my child. And I do wonder sometimes, am I overcorrecting with my own kids? But one thing I do <laughs> try and do with them is I want them to know that I love them irrespective yeah. of what grades they get, what they that's do, amazing. whether they've been kind, whether they've not been kind. It's like, I will always love them. And I want them to know that. And just hearing the impact that had on Kobe, I think was really mm -hmm. very powerful for me to hear. It gives me confidence that hopefully I am doing the right thing. Or of course, only time will tell. But the other thing, Lewis, that came up for me is you were talking about his definition of greatness and that it's about inspiring other people, mm -hmm. right? And I agree with that. But there's a slight clash in my head. Let's say Michael Jordan, for example. There's no question Michael Jordan has inspired millions of people yes. over the last few decades, right? So uh -huh. he's ticked off the inspiration box because of his phenomenal play. Even me as a non-basketball fan was inspired by watching him as a kid thinking, wow, that's ridiculous what he can do, right? But if, and again, this is an if, but if he has internal pain and internal struggles that have driven him. Yes, he's inspiring people. Is that still greatness? Mm. I just think it's not the highest level of greatness. Yes. I think your results are great. Your success is great. But if we as human beings still suffer, then we still have to do work on ourselves. And yeah. we've still got to take a look at why we suffer. I don't think greatness is internal suffering. I don't think that's that's a part of it. Like external results and internal suffering, I feel like it's the harmony you have yeah. within yourself, which I think is the hardest thing to do is to face yourself. Face your insecurities, your shames, your doubts, your pains, the things that people have done to you, things that you've done to people that were not okay, and facing it all. Yeah. No one really likes that. It's not a fun journey. It's not like, oh, I get to go do this today and face the the, the darkest parts of me. That's not enjoyable. Yeah. But I think that work, that intention, that reflection, the integration of healing daily that it takes to to cultivate more peace. And again, I'm, I'm a human being, so I have challenges and struggles and get flustered every now and then too. But it's the constant work of reminding myself and improving, which which I think is, is more helpful and useful. Yeah. You know, I lived in a big high-rise building uh, a few years ago here in L.A., and a lot of successful people in this building, a lot of celebrities and famous people and, you know, people with a lot of money. And during COVID, there was a guy who was worth a half a billion dollars who jumped out of the building, committed suicide. It was the day after Father's Day. And I'm not trying to assume I know what happened or connecting the dots or anything, but it was the day after Father's Day. He didn't have a good relationship with his son. His son wasn't in his life. And um, he had all the money in the world, but it didn't seem like he had love in his heart with, he was alone, he was single, you know, all these different things. So again, I'm not, I don't know what caused it, yeah. but there was a lot of underlying things that, uh huh, that's interesting, that might've influenced it. And there might be some other stuff that he hadn't faced and dealt with internally that caused him yeah. to, to jump. And again, you know, I... 
I just think when people hurt themselves or want to hurt themselves, it's because they are hurt inside and they don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. And they don't know how to face it. And so they hurt themselves through being an alcoholic or drugs or, you know, cutting themselves or hitting themselves or causing themselves to get in physical harm, getting in fights or wanting to commit suicide. And there's a, a way to heal that is extremely scary for so many people. And so I get it because it took me so long to yeah. start the process. And you feel like you're going to die when you face these things. It feels like, how could I ever say this? Me talking to a group of people about being sexually abused for the first time, I thought my life was over. I thought these people are going to hate me. No one's going to yeah. love me. They're going to kick me out. Like, I just thought like my life was over and I wasn't going to make any money anymore. My business is going to fail because now people really know this about me. Uh, I'm going to be kicked out of society. That's just like where my, my thoughts went. It just was mm -hmm. like, uh, you don't feel safe. And so it's one of the scariest things to do to, to reveal past pains. And I'm not saying you need to do this publicly, but finding a safe space to do yeah. it, a safe person to talk to or someone confidential to talk to, I think is important. And it's one of the elements of the greatness mindset. And uh, I'm not sure if I got you a physical hard copy over there, but on page 201, I give a graphic in the book and yep. I'm just, I'm happy to explain it. It's kind of like an assessment. This is to ask yourself and to reflect, are you living in a powerless mindset state of being or are you more in the greatness mindset? So this is a way for you to reflect and just ask yourself, you don't have to tell anyone, but just to think about yourself, am I more powerless right now or am I more in greatness? And it doesn't mean you're bad and wrong if you are in a powerless state. It doesn't mean you can't be effective. It doesn't mean you can't get results in your life and get a relationship and all these things. It just means that there are certain things that still have power over you from being more effective, from having more joy, more yeah. love, more peace, more harmony, and therefore attracting more of what you want in your life, creating and manifesting more of what you want in your life. So a powerless mindset, is someone that lacks a meaningful mission. And I believe the enemy of greatness is lacking a meaningful mission. You know, there's nothing more dangerous than a man without a mission. A wandering man who's just susceptible to all of life's desires, pleasures, and mm. uh, you know, anything that could pull him away from yeah. something intentional. So lacking a meaningful mission just means you're, you're not clear on what you want. And when you're not clear, you're in a state of confusion. And we can have transitions, we can have off seasons, we can have seasons of life where we're in recovery, we are in discovery, but just yeah. be clear that this is a season of recovery and discovery and figuring things out. But that's what you're clear on for that mission. Number two is you're controlled by fear. Again, fear is gonna happen, but when it controls us, we are in a power of the state. So we need, must learn how to face and embrace it and manage and work with fear, but not let it control us. Number three is crippled by self-doubt. This is something that held me back for many years. Mm. This was the whole, this whole start of the School of Greatness was to figure out how I can overcome self-doubt because I was successful, but I still doubted myself. And that's what hurt me and caused me to be insecure, mm. second guess, people please. I was an extreme people pleaser because uh, I was crippled by self-doubt. Number four, conceals past pains. I think there's 20,000 plus books on mindset and success. If you go on Amazon, you'll see 20,000 different books. Most of them talk about discipline, willpower, which you mentioned, um, hard work, grit, all these things that we think of with success. But I don't know many of them that talk about revealing past pains yeah. and healing. And I just think that is everything. Yeah. You know, you can teach people how to work hard, set goals, you know, show up on time, be consistent, but it's so much harder to deal with the stuff inside of us that is messy and scary. And I just think that's what gives us peace and freedom. So concealing past pains, it doesn't mean you're bad or wrong. It just means you're more powerless because you're concealing something. You're afraid that if someone knows this about you, they won't accept you or love you. But typically it's because you don't accept and fully love yourself. Yeah. And so that's what you're most afraid of. The fifth thing is defined by the opinions of others. Again, this was something that crippled me for years. I wasn't afraid of failure or success because I knew failure was the path to success and I wanted to be successful, but I was afraid by the opinions of others. So I would people please, I would get defensive anytime someone left criticism. 
I would, uh, you know, say yes to everyone because I wanted people to like me. And it caused me to feel overwhelmed, stressed, and I would abandon myself. And the, and the sixth thing is drifting towards complacency. Um, I just think you're more powerless when you're not in a state of trying to grow, learn, or create something yeah. to help others. And so it's just asking yourself, do I have any of these six things that come up from time to time or daily? And it doesn't make you wrong or bad because I've had all of these at different times in my life. And I was still effective in certain areas, but I wasn't feeling the way I wanted to feel yeah. when I was effective. The greatness mindset is driven by a meaningful mission. And Rangan, for me, I have a one sentence meaningful mission that guides me. It directs me on which direction to go. It helps me make clearer decisions. It gives me more focus. The greatness mindset is having a clear, meaningful mission and driven by that. Turning fears into confidence. We talked about that a little bit earlier about how I created a list, a fear list. And I went all in on these fears until the fears went away, mm -hmm. until they disappeared. And we all are going to face fears at different times and at different seasons. I'm not a father yet, Rangin, so I'm, I'm assuming when I am a father, I'm going to have to face new fears, yeah. new insecurities, new uncertainties. Uh, what do I do here? I don't know. And so I'm going to always need to face new fears at different seasons of life. And we have to turn those into confidence. Yeah. That's greatness. Overcoming self-doubt. Again, same thing. Not being crippled by it, but overcoming it by facing it. Healing past pain. I believe this is greatness. When you can realize that there are some wounds, there's some hurts, there's some things that have happened that have affected you, that has become a, a belief for you, a story, a narrative for you, and you've allowed that to run your life in certain ways. We haven't healed. And so as a doctor, you would never tell someone who breaks an arm to just go out there and start using their arm again. You would tell them, you need to heal that. You need to put a cast on it. You need to set the bone. You need to like just lay around and relax for a while. You need to not work. You need to rest. Mm -hmm. You need to recover. Let the yeah. body heal. Let your mind heal. And then it's going to take some time because it's going to hurt. Once you get the cast off, you have to get your elbow, your wrist back on. It's going to take some rehab. You're going to need three months, six months. For me, it took a year and a half of rehab to get my wrist and my elbow because they put me a bone graft. They took a bone from my hip, put it mm -hmm. in my wrist. And I was in a 90 degree angle like this in, in the cast for six months. Wow. So I couldn't straighten my elbow because it was in this position, 90 degrees for six months. The elbow was painful and that's not what I broke. I broke my wrist. It took a year and a half until I could just get like minimal function. Yeah. And so you're not going to prescribe me, you know what, go out there and just start like hammering away on the weights and doing pull-ups right away and just like using your wrist within the first year. You're going to say, you need to heal. But a lot of times we experience emotional wounds, psychological wounds, spiritual wounds, and we just get right back on the horse the next yeah. day. And we push through the wound and it never fully heals. And that wound is a trigger for us forever. And again, you would never prescribe someone to go out there on a broken leg and start running a marathon the next day. That would be bad advice and you'd lose your, your you know, license probably as a doctor. But- we prescribe this yeah. all the time with our emotional wounds. And that is not greatness. We must heal past wounds. Create a healthy identity. I think a lot of us, Rankin, I don't know if this is a uh, something that happens in the UK, but if you would have taken a voice recorder and you could hear my internal dialogue for a lot of the years that I've lived, before the last 10 years. And you could have voice recorded what I said to myself. You're such an idiot. You're a dummy. You're never going to amount to anything. You're such a loser. You're worthless. You're, you're an idiot. If you would have heard this over and over again, you would have recorded it. And you would have played it in a loudspeaker on the streets of your city. They'd probably be like, what is wrong with this guy? We got to send him to a mental institution, right? Yeah. A hospital. This guy needs help. And imagine if you'd say these things to your partner, your spouse, your parents, your yeah. friends, your teachers, you'd speak to them the way we speak to ourselves sometimes. No one would want to be your friend. No one. They'd be like, don't speak to me this way. Don't treat me this way. But for whatever reason, human beings tend to treat ourselves so horribly to ourselves and say the meanest, nastiest things on repeat. That is an unhealthy identity. That is not greatness. And so creating a healthy identity is learning to 
be a better positive yeah. self coach as opposed to a negative critic. Give yourself feedback, but be kind to yourself. So creating a healthy identity. And then the sixth thing is taking action with a game plan. For me, yeah. those are the elements of greatness. Those yeah. are the things that we all get to work on and practice consistently. These are not easy things. These are not things that just happen overnight. It takes practice. It takes time. It takes having tools. Yeah. And that's why I wrote The Greatest Mindset because I was I wrote this for me 10 years ago when I was stuck, <laughs> struggling, in breakdown after breakdown, in transition, trying to figure out who am I? What am I supposed to do? I've been successful, but I feel like I have no purpose. And I feel like I have no love in my heart and I have no peace and I'm in constant breakdown. So I wrote this for me, for the you know 10 year old, 21 year old, 30 year old uh, and current self to have the tools I need to have peace. And I think your um, acknowledgement at the start of the book really reflects that. You know, I dedicate this book to my younger self for having the courage to carry me through pain, my current self for facing my shame and learning how to heal, and to my future self because the journey to greatness has only just begun. A very, very powerful acknowledgement right at the start of the book really speaks to everything you've mm. just been talking about. You, of course, mentioned a meaningful mission. You said you can say yours mm -hmm. in one sentence. What is your meaningful mission? Yeah, mine is to serve and impact 100 million lives weekly to help them improve the quality of their life. And it's clear. It's one sentence. It's one direction. And I'm not beholden to a certain mechanism. Yeah. Again, I didn't say like my goal is to be the number one podcaster in the world. It is to serve 100 million lives weekly. So I'm striving to get to that place to be able to reach and serve in 100 million lives weekly, which allows me to, again, the mechanisms can evolve and change. But the mission is the same and it's clear. And that may evolve, that may change. It doesn't yeah. mean I have to be stuck with this mission for the rest of my life. It's just the season of life that I'm yeah. in, that's the mission that I'm on. When I was on my sister's couch, it was just how do I make enough money to get off my sister's couch? I couldn't think beyond that. I was just like, how do I be a grown up? You know, let me figure this out. Let me overcome fears. That's the season and the mission that I was in. Uh, and then once I was overcoming that, then I was able to see farther and say, okay, what's my new mission? I'm going to transition. Okay, great. Yeah. And I think a lot of people aren't clear on their meaningful mission. They know like, oh, I've got this job that I want to do, or I've got this idea, or I've got this career path, or I've, I want to be in a relationship. Okay, but what is the meaning of it? Yeah. What is the purpose of it? And just this allows you to get clearer on scheduling your time. To make sure you're taking action after watching this video, I've created a free guide to help you build healthy habits. We can all make short-term change, but can those changes become a fundamental part of our life? Often they don't. And that's why in this free guide, I share with you the six crucial steps you need to take. They're really, really effective. If you want to get hold of that free guide right now, all you have to do is click the link in the description box below. To get clearer on what you say yes and no to. Yeah. Because if I, without a meaningful mission, then I'm just like, oh, there's so many projects I want to do. I'm going to do them all. Okay, great. But diluted efforts get diluted results, as my friend Rory Vaden says. And so we don't want to dilute everything. You can, you can do that. And that, if that's the life you want to live, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's probably not going to be the most impactful on optimizing something. Yeah. So it just depends on what you want. A couple, couple of really important things you've just touched on, Lewis, which I'd, I'd love to just respond to. One is the seasons of life. I think that is so important for people to really take a minute to, to sit with, because I think sometimes we hear people on podcasts or someone that people look up to say something in think that that has to apply to us at this moment in life and in no. every moment in life. But as you so beautifully put, life changes, your goals change. Mm -hmm. that, that I think it's a really nice way to think about it. I'm thinking about maybe someone who's listening to the show at the moment who maybe is a mother of children. And at the moment, part of their meaningful mission may well be different from when their kids have left home in five years. Yes. You know, exactly. because it's a different season in our life. I thought that was really important. But also what you said about your mission mm. and the mission doesn't really get lost in the mechanism of delivery, right? You can be uh, serving that mission through your books, through your podcast, 
through some social media posts. Maybe you're going to go on a book tour and talk to people. You've got multiple delivery mechanisms for that yes. mission, right? And I was thinking when you were talking about someone with that job, well, the job is a mechanism, right? It's a delivery yes. mechanism. But what sits higher than what you're actually doing? That's the point, isn't it? Because then that insulates you in case you ever lose that job or if you retire or whatever. That's when it can get problematic when it's all in on that job. Whereas if the job is serving a higher mission, mm -hmm. that's the message I get from, from that yes. chapter in the book. Would you agree with that? 100%. Yeah. And again, we can't always control outside forces or factors. You might get lost from your job. And then if you put your whole identity around a career as opposed to a mission, let's say you're a graphic designer and you put your identity into the career that you're at and you get a job and they, they cut you for whatever reason and they let you go, it's going to be a lot more painful if your mission is the job as yeah. versus I want to be the best designer and I want to create inspiring designs in this industry. Okay, cool. Then you can go to a different mechanism after that. It doesn't mean it may not be challenging and painful and stressful time, but at least your whole identity is not shattered yeah. around one thing. You put it into your effort, you put it into your attitude, your energy, your creativity, your generosity towards the thing you're looking to create in the world. I think that sets you up for more success. All right, let's go to a thought experiment then, Lewis, which just came to Give me. Give it to me. Okay, so you got your mission. You want to impact these 100 mm -hmm. million people every week. Now, of course, being as successful as you are, you have mechanisms by which you can reach a lot of people yep. each week. Now, let's imagine overnight, Podcasting disappeared, right? Yeah. Social media disappeared. YouTube disappeared, right? So a lot of these delivery mechanisms you currently rely on to meet your meaningful mission, mm -hmm. they vanish. Mm -hmm. What do you do like tomorrow? How do you then approach this mission when all these things that you've relied on no longer exist? Yeah, I mean, if that was the case... It would have to be, I would try to see if there's other mechanisms that could reach masses of people. So is that TV? Is that newspapers? Is that magazine? I would just look for other outlets. Is that WhatsApp? I don't know. I would just look for other outlets. If all those went away and there was no way to reach masses of people in short periods of time, for whatever reason, then my mission would evolve into changing the number. Yeah. And it always starts with one. So even though my mission is to serve 100 million lives weekly, to help them improve the quality of their life. Like if this reaches one person, this book, and you know, it's, it's going to reach a lot of people, but if it reaches one and it impacts them, I'm also in my mission. Yeah. I'm also living in my mission of service, of impacting one person to improve the quality of their life. And so that is still in part of my mission. And that doesn't mean I've failed if only one person a day is in, is that I'm in service to. The milestone or the end mission would be to get to 100 million lives. That allows me to think creatively and get out of my comfort zone. That allows me to say yes and no to things that could support me getting there faster. That allows me to use my time more wisely to create media, content, and say yes or no to things that could reach more people because that's the goal. If the ability wasn't able to reach more people that wasn't available I could still have that mission in place that I want to reach 100 million lives every week, but maybe I'm only reaching 10 a, a week. I'm still not going to beat myself up because I'm in service. And I think that's what we got to look at. You know, and here's, a, here's an interesting concept for you. It's a great example for you. I wanted to be an Olympian. I wanted to go to the Olympics. My entire life, I wanted to do this. Uh, and when I got injured playing football, I was in my cast living on my sister's couch. And during this time, the 2008 Summer Olympics was on during this time. So I'm kind of down and out. I'm kind of like, you know, a little depressed because I realized my dream of playing football is probably over. And I was in denial for a little bit because I thought, oh, I'm going to heal up in six weeks, come back and train for the next season. But life happened and it took me six months in a cast and another year to recover. But I'm watching the Olympics in 2008 and I see this sport that I'd never seen before, ever. And I'd watched every sport. But the sport came on in the Olympics at like 3 a.m. called Team Handball. And it's pretty much unknown in the U.S. It's like water polo, 
but on a basketball court with no water is kind of how it looks mm. like. And it's, um, it's not that big in USA or the UK, but it's big in other countries in Europe. And I saw this sport and I go, wow, this is fascinating. I feel like this is the sport I was meant to play. It was kind of perfect for my size and my abilities as an athlete. And I said to myself in 2008, I am going to go to the Olympics. This is the dream. This is the mission. And I said, well, I started doing research. Okay, is there teams in the USA? Is there a team in Ohio where I was living? Like, how do I join a team? How do I learn this sport? There was really not much information. And I realized that there were no teams except for club teams in specific cities. There was nothing in Ohio. I saw that the national champion club team was in New York City at the time. I tried to reach out to people, try to see if there's a phone number for the club. There was nothing. So I said, okay, when I make enough money, I'm going to move to New York City and I'm going to go play with this team and try to make the USA national team. Two years goes by. I eventually make enough money. I go to New York City. I join this club, this New York City handball club. The first day I get there, I say, my name's Lewis. I'm from Ohio. I'm here to learn handball and make the USA team and go to the Olympics. They all laugh at me. They're all laughing. They're like, this is crazy. Who are you? Go back home. I stick around. In nine months, I practice with the team. I play with the team. And nine months later, I made the USA national team. Now, shortly after that, I go to Buenos Aires and I play in the Pan Am Championships. And then for eight years, I have this dream, this mission in mind that I'm going to make it to the Olympics. Now, it's a team sport. So the team has to qualify. And they only take one country from North and South America who wins the Pan Am Games to go to the Olympics. Again, that's once every four years. So you have to win this one tournament. Now, a lot of teams in South America, a lot of countries in South America that have professional teams and leagues, and they play since they're kids. Mm. No one in the USA plays this sport. So it's very competitive to win the Pan Am Games. And we haven't done it in like, I don't know, 30 or 40 years or something. And so we haven't been to the Olympics in 20 plus years is the USA. But if the USA hosted the Olympics, it would be an automatic qualifier. So I was hoping that we would get an automatic qualifier and we would host the Olympics. That never happened. The last time I played was a couple of years ago and I did not accomplish the mission. But even though the dream didn't come true, doesn't mean it wasn't a dream come true. The experience I got to play all over the world. I got to yeah. wear USA against my chest. I grew as an athlete. I became a better leader. I, I did. I followed my dreams, and I didn't accomplish the mission. But I'm not going to beat myself up for not succeeding yeah. at the end mission because the eight nine year journey was incredible. Yeah, the friendships I built, what I learned about myself. I traveled. I played against national teams in. Israel, Luxembourg, and, and the UK, uh, Mexico, Canada, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Chile. I played against Olympic teams, and I got to experience like a taste of it. Yeah. But I'm not beating myself up because I didn't accomplish the mission. Yeah, very powerful. It just didn't happen for me. So I think we got we to gotta understand that the experiences we have are just as meaningful, even if we didn't accomplish the end goal. And I just think it's the journey of who you become in the process of going after yeah. something that you're excited about. The Olympics, a quarter of a percent of a quarter of a percent of a quarter of a percent of people make the Olympics. Like it's already like the, a crazy thing to try to even do. Uh, so the chances are so slim. And yeah, I wanted to do it and I wanted to be a part of it and go to the athlete's village and walk in the opening ceremony and compete and-, and yeah you know, get to be in that exclusive club of being an Olympian and have that life memory, but it didn't happen. And I can beat myself up for it, or I can say, man, you gave it your all. Yeah, You gave it your all and you inspired the people around you. And they then went and gave their all, inspired the people around you, like Kobe said. And I can be proud of that. You know, Lewis, what's really powerful about that as I reflect on the content of your book, this idea of a meaningful mission, is that it's also what you said earlier on in this conversation, Lewis, that there's nothing more dangerous than a man, I think, without a mission, mm -hmm. I think you said. Without a mission. Right? Yeah. Because the mission becomes the North Star. 
It mm-hmm. helps guide you in a world where there is infinite choice now, right? There are so many options. There's so much information. It can be paralyzing. It can bring us down. It can lead to paralysis because there's too much choice out there. What I'm hearing is that get clear on your mission. You can change your mission. It doesn't have to be forever, but at least you have one and that will help guide your decisions. And like your goal to be an Olympian, you didn't make it, but Mm -hmm. what a journey you went on. How much did you learn about yourself? And had you not had that mission, what would you have spent your time doing otherwise? Who knows, but maybe it would Mm -hmm. not have been as meaningful. So I think that's a really powerful story. What I think is so powerful about the book and your story is this idea that greatness only begins when you heal the pain and trauma of the past, right? We've already said that once, but I think mm-hmm. it's such a key message for people because it's easy for people to skip that and go, hey, yeah, but come on, let's get to the good stuff, right? Let's get to the right. stuff, the routines, yeah, right? Tell me how to make money. Tell me how to succeed. Tell me how to do these things. And here's the thing, something I've learned, there's a difference between success and greatness. My whole life I was chasing success and I got it. Yeah. But I didn't feel great. I didn't feel fulfilled. I didn't feel love. I didn't feel loved. And I didn't know how to love myself. And I had a lot of anger and resentment and frustration still inside of me. So I got the success. I achieved it. I did it in sports, then in business, then in social media. It's like I did it in lots of different ways to chase something to get a feeling. The feeling never came Mm -hmm. because I have to cultivate the feeling from within. I have to be love. I have to be peace. I can't have more money to create more peace. You know, and they they say that more money, more problems. It's true if you don't have peace. If you have more money, you can solve money problems, but it doesn't mean you don't not manage the stress in your heart. And it probably causes more stress because now you have more to, to stress about. Yeah. So it doesn't mean you can't solve certain things with it, but it doesn't teach you how to love yourself. It doesn't teach you how to heal. And so more success for me, I realized was not helping. And success by itself, my definition is a selfish endeavor. I want to accomplish this goal for me. I want to make this money for me. I want to be a doctor for me. If it's about me. Now, when it becomes greatness is when we say, okay, I want to do this for me and to be of service to others in the process. I want to do this to support myself and accomplish my dreams and goals, but I want to do it in the support and service of others as well. Yeah. A lot of people you probably know who wanted to be a doctor because it would make them look good. Yeah. <laughs> it would make them be protected, make them safe, make them get respect in their community, from their family, make them have uh, wealth for them. And that's fine. You'll be successful. But to transition to greatness is when you say, you know what, I really want to be a doctor because I want to have a great opportunity for myself but I care a lot about people yeah. and their well-being and their health. And I really want to be of service to people. I want to do it because I want to be able to offer more for my family, for my kids in the future. I want to do it for something greater than only me. It's yeah. including you, your needs and wants, but also in the service of others. Yeah. And when we just make that slight adjustment, that's when we start transitioning from success into greatness with the service of others, that impact of the people around us where they can ripple and impact people around them yeah. because of the way you show up. And I just think it's a it's a slight shift. It's going from, I wanna do this to look good, to win, to be right, which is success, into I wanna do this to help others. I wanna do this to create a win for me, but also a win for yeah. others. And in that process, you really create greatness. I wonder, Lewis, if you'd be open to sharing some of your journey from the abuse that happened, Mm -hmm. but then to that point where you felt confident enough to share that. Because what you said about men as well before, I think there'll be men listening to this right now. Many of them will have something inside of them. Maybe it's not as extreme as what happened to you. Maybe it is. You said this happened when you were five years old. And please, if you don't want to go here, that's completely fine Mm -hmm. as well, Lewis. Who knew? I mean, when was the first time you told somebody? No one knew. No one knew until I was 30 years old. And so for 25 years, no one knew. No one. I didn't tell anyone. No one. 
And so for 25 years, I remember I had a, a college professor. This was kind of the time when I first started to really, I thought about telling my professor because it was in like a sociology class in college. And he was talking about like the effects and harm of sexual abuse or something in society. And I was like, oh, wow, this is the first time I'm hearing someone talk about this. And I started to reflect about it. And I remember just kind of going into him and asking him more about it. But I didn't have the courage to tell him that this happened to me. But I was like, can you tell me more about these effects and what this does in society mm -hmm. and this and this? And I think maybe he knew because I was like asking him. It's like, why is this kind of jock football player coming to my office asking me these questions after this class? He probably maybe like assumed, but he didn't ask me. And he was yeah. just kind of like answering my questions. But I really wanted to because I thought maybe it would be a safer space. But I was like, ah, I can't say it. So... I just ruminated it on it almost every day. This kind of memory or movie would play in my mind of the whole experience throughout my entire life. And you told nobody, no friends, nobody, you, no one. You nobody, didn't. Man. Did you ever consider girlfriends? It? I never told girl. I never told girlfriends. Like I wanted to, but again, I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel I'd be accepted. I I was afraid of like someone not loving me, not liking me. Um, so I wanted to with girlfriends, but I didn't have the courage and I didn't have the skills or the tools or the confidence in myself to be able to speak it and be okay if someone didn't accept me. When we live in shame and insecurity, we typically don't accept ourselves. In that process, we don't belong to ourselves because we're holding on to so much shame and insecurity about something that happened to us, something we did bad that we're not you know, proud of. And so we hold on to this. It means we, we're, we're not accepting it. We don't belong to it. We haven't faced it and processed it. And, and so I couldn't accept myself. That's why I had to work harder. That's why I was like, I need to be the best. I need to win. And when I lost, I felt like I had no value. Yeah. So losing a sports game was extremely hard for me because it was life or death feeling is what it felt like emotionally. I know physically it wasn't, but emotionally I was like, if I lose, then I'm not a valuable person, then I'm not going to be accepted, then no one's going to like me, no one's going to love me. So I must win at all costs. And that is a heavy price to pay to live that way and to feel like suffering after every loss in a, in a high school basketball game, in a college basketball game. It's not like there's some massive stakes on the line here. You know, there's some stakes, but it's not like life or death. And so when I hit 30, all these breakdowns started to happen in my life. An intimate relationship was just up and down, up and down emotional. A business partnership was up and down, up and down, and we weren't seeing eye to eye. And I was a reactive person in life. I was easily triggered at this time. Now, Rangan, I was a, I was a fun, loving, happy guy. I was very much similar to who I am now. Love people, wanted to high five people, give people big hugs. Like I'm a, I'm a loving guy. But when you poked the wound or wounds that were inside of me, it was like a reaction would come out. It was like I had to protect and defend myself at all costs or my honor or my respect or my whatever it was. I had to like defend it. So therefore, I was easily triggered in life. If someone said something to me, don't say that to me. If someone looked at me weird, don't look at me. You know, it's like this reaction. And that's all because of a, a past pain or pains that I had inside of me mm -hmm. that I hadn't faced and healed. So those were the root causes that yeah. caused me to be responsive and reactive in unhealthy ways in situations in life. If someone cut me off in the street that I felt like, oh, they're trying to cut me off. Let me get up in front of them and look at him with a stare. You know, it's like yeah. all these things that, how is that serving or supporting me my abundance, my health, and my mission. It's not helping me at all. So when I was 30, I, I got into an actual physical fight on a basketball court. And this was kind of like the last, <laughs> the last breakdown. I got in a physical fight in like a no stakes basketball game, a pickup friendly basketball game. Mm -hmm. And it was a pretty, in, pretty intense fight, like a full on fist fight. And I'm not proud of. And after the game, one of my best friends was there with me playing. And he goes, Lewis, what are you doing, man? He goes, I don't know why you're so reactive in these situations that are meaningless. Why do you let people get under your skin? 
Why are you so reactive? Why are you so mm-hmm. triggered to defend yourself? Like, there's no physical threat here. It's not like I get if there's someone's actually trying to hurt you physically, okay, like defend yourself. But if someone says something to you, just let it go. And um, he was like, I really don't want to hang out with you anymore if you're going to keep acting this way, if you're going to be volatile. And that was a wake up call for me. And I remember going home after this fight, kind of like shaken. I was really like shaken because I was like, just got into this fight. There was a lot of adrenaline. And I was looking myself in the mirror at this time. And I was just asked myself, who are you? Looking in the mirror, I looked in my eyes and I just didn't recognize myself. And I kind of lost who I was. And I really don't know if I ever found who I was because I was always chasing success to fulfill something inside of me that was not there, Mm -hmm. that I hadn't claimed. It was there, but I hadn't owned it. Harmony, peace, acceptance, self-love. I had a lot of self-hatred. I had a lot of frustration, anger, resentment. I didn't forgive. I didn't forgive others, you know, the person who abused me and, and kids who picked on me and bullied me. I didn't, I didn't forgive them and I didn't forgive myself. And um, that was a wake-up call that got me down a path of yeah. going to different workshops, meeting different therapists, talking to different coaches, going to meditation retreats in India, doing Wim Hof intense ice training in, yeah. in Poland, breathing, meditation, ice bath training, doing heat therapies, doing, uh, you know, I did Dr. Joe Dispenza's seven day intensive meditation neuroscience retreat. I've worked with different therapists over the last 10 years. So I've tried lots of different healing modalities Mm -hmm. and they all work. You know, whatever you decide to go all in on will work for you. So there's not like one thing that's like better than the others or something, but there was a workshop that I did early on that got me to face my past in a group setting. So it was a work, an emotional intelligence workshop that I did 10 years ago that had you ref, it had like different games and exercises and scenarios over a number of days to reflect on your past, on what got you here in your life in the present, and then to reflect on what your vision is for the future that you wanna create. But in order to create a powerful future, we must first face the past and see what are the behaviors, beliefs, thoughts, and emotions that are supporting us today or that are holding us back. And so after a few days of this workshop, we had done a lot of stuff of facing past, you know, talking about facing your parents, you know, kind of within Mm -hmm. yourself, doing exercises to like let go of pain, to talk about the different challenges, things like that. And I remember there was a moment in the halfway mark of this workshop where the trainer, the facilitator said, okay, now we're going to create a a vision of the future that we wanna create and start having tools to step into that. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, if there's anything you haven't shared that you feel like you need to share, now's your moment. Because you have to face everything in the past before you can move forward. And I'm thinking, we're all kind of sitting there, maybe a group of like 40 people, And I remember thinking, well, okay, I talked about everything. I feel like I talked about my parents going through divorce and kind of being stressed out Mm -hmm. in the house growing up as a kid and not feeling safe. Talked about um, my brother being in prison and what that did for me and the pain that caused me. Talked about being picked on and bullied in in middle school and high school. I talked about heartbreaks from relationships. Like, I feel like I've processed all this stuff. And for whatever reason, I was like, well, why have I never shared this one story with anyone? about being sexually abused. And for whatever reason, like I just felt like if I don't share this right now, I'll probably never share it in my life. It'll probably go to my grave. So I was in a, I was in a setting where I felt like safe and open and people were being open and I, I just stood up. I just got the courage in that moment to stand up. I walked to the front of the room. Um, everyone was kind of seated in a horseshoe, like seating uh, assignment. I walk into the front of the room and the interesting thing rang in about shame It's hard to look people in the eyes when you experience a lot of shame. It's extremely hard. And for me, I was living in so much shame. So I looked down as I stood up at the carpet and I just looked down and I I just went back to the place where I was as a five-year-old and I shared the entire story from all my memories. I shared the whole story 
and verbally expressed it for the first time. And I remember I did not look up at anyone. I was terrified of looking at anyone's eyes. So I just stayed down here and talked about it. And then I walked back to my chair. I was able to get through it like kind of calm. I like was trembling a little bit and like a little shaky, but I was able to speak about it without, you know, breaking apart, breaking apart. And I get back and I walk back to my chair and I don't look up until I sit down. And there was a, a woman on each side of me sitting next to me, two different women. And for whatever reason, like I look over and I see her eyes and she's weeping and she just grabs me and hugs me and she's bawling in my, sh- my shoulder. And then the other woman grabs me and she hugs me and she's bawling. They're just weeping. And for whatever reason, I just like, I don't know, 25 years of pain and suffering just comes out of me. Like I finally released it and just, I just start bawling and crying and releasing this pain. But, but half of it is fear and shame and like thinking everyone's going to hate me and no one's going to love me. Whatever reason, I was just like, after, I don't know, 30, 60 seconds, I was just bawling, I was crying, and I felt so ashamed that I was now crying and bawling Mm -hmm. in front of everyone, and I just shared this. And then I ran out of this kind of, this room we were all in, this conference room we were all in. I run out of the building, and behind the building, there's a little back alleyway behind this building, and I there's a wall on the other side of the alley and I put my head like up against the wall with my hands and I'm just kind of like leaning against the wall, just bawling, bawling. And I'm outside, I'm trying to breathe. I'm just like, I can't go back in there. My life is over. I cannot go back in there. I can't face these people. Like uh, my life is done. Uh, It's over. That's the way it felt. It felt like I was dying. And one of the most beautiful things that's probably ever happened in my life happened after this moment was a few minutes I'm out there, again, crying just by myself. And then I feel a tap on the back of my shoulder. And I turn around and it's this older gentleman who was in the group. He was probably in his late 50s. And at the time I was 30. It's about my height, but a little bit bigger, just like a big, like manly man, you know, older manly man. And he looks me dead in the eyes And he grabs my shoulders and he goes, you're my hero. You're my hero. And I'll tell you why. Because in my 50s, this happened to me when I was 11, 12, and 13. I've been married for 30 years. I got three daughters. My wife doesn't know. My kids don't know. No one knows. I've carried this with me for my whole life. You're my hero because you're going to give me permission now to go share this with my wife and allow me to find peace and healing. Thank you. And I'm like, now he's crying. I'm crying. We're hugging each other. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what? I was like, for my whole life, I thought I was the only one that had experienced this. Again, I hadn't heard anyone say there's other men that have been sexually abused. I'd heard this happen in women. Mm -hmm. And I'd heard women talk about this on TV or whatever it might be in the media, but not men. And... And so when I heard this from this man who was, again, this big kind of burly man, this older, wiser man, I was like, what? And there was a couple other guys that came out who had also experienced sexual abuse that told me. We were all outside, these guys. And then more men came out from this, this group. And they just told me other things that they had been through, not sexual abuse, but other traumas and challenges. And they're like, I've never experienced, I've never shared this with anyone. And it was one of the, craziest things that happened because the thing that I was most afraid of, the most ashamed of, that I thought everyone would hate me or not like me or not love me by doing it actually got me more love, got me liked by more people, more respect, more trust, more vulnerability from other men and women um, when I thought it was going to be the thing that ruined me. And that began the process Mm -hmm. of of healing and facing it. And it didn't mean it was overnight, I was fine. It took me a couple years of continuing the conversation with family, with friends, with, and then I eventually started opening up publicly on my podcast. And I thought when I opened up publicly, like my life was over. I thought then, okay, my business is done, my life is over. Lewis, if we weren't on Zoom, 
I'd give you a big hug right now. Thank you so much for sharing <laughs> course, that. Man. So, so powerful. How did you take the leap from there to going, I'm now going <sighs> to share this with my huge global audience? It wasn't as big 10 years ago as it is now, <laughs> but it felt big in terms of like, you know, sharing something with any anyone publicly felt like, okay, this is out there. This is now in the world. You, mm -hmm. you know, people have this record now, wh whoever sees it in the future. Maybe like six months or nine months had gone by. And I, after this workshop was done, I felt like, wow, I felt accepted by this group of people because they were sharing other vulnerabilities that they were going through. And so it was a powerful experience. But I was like, huh, will my family accept me? Will my friends accept me? So it took me a few weeks mm -hmm. to get the courage to actually tell my family one by one. And I, again, I realized that this was still a fear of mine. If I can't tell my family, then it has power over me. Yeah. Then I'm holding on to a fear and a past pain because I'm afraid of what they'll think. I'm afraid they'll judge me. I'm afraid they'll you know, push me out of the family or whatever the fear was. Mm. So I realized for me, I needed to tell them because this thing still had power over me. It still affected me. If I was unwilling to speak it because I was afraid, it had power over me. So I did it with my family one by one and I was terrified. And I talked to a therapist beforehand. I said, what's the best way to approach this? And she gave me a great piece of advice. She said, call each one of them and tell them you have something vulnerable you wanna share with them, but ask them first to make sure that they're in a good setting and a good space to receive it. Mm -hmm. And don't share it with them unless you think they're in a good place to receive it. And ask them this question, is there anything I could ever do or say that would make you not love me? And then see how they respond. And if they respond and you feel in a safe space, then feel free to share. But if they're like, you know, making a joke or they're not in a good space, like maybe it's not the right time to share it. And each one of them were like, absolutely not. There's nothing you could ever do or say that would make me not love you. So they gave me like permission to then mm. communicate it. And, and then I thought to myself, okay, but the beautiful thing is when I did that, like each one of them opened up to me about things yeah. that I didn't know about them that they had experienced. It wasn't sexual abuse, but it was just other things that they, they felt like they wanted to share with me. I didn't even ask them. So it brought us closer and had a deeper relationship, more intimacy. And then I thought to myself, okay, well, these strangers, I'll never see them again from this workshop. So it doesn't matter as much. Yeah. My family, they have to love me, but I couldn't tell my friends. And so a couple of weeks go by and I go, dang it, this thing still has power over me if I'm unwilling to speak it to my friends. And I'm not saying this is the path that everyone needs to go on, but this was the path that I needed to go on for me, mm. to be free, to set myself free. And so I started telling friends one by one, kind of sh the same type of setup. And they were all very accepting and loving and supportive, which I was like, huh, male friends, female friends, all of it. And then I said, well, they're my friends. They have to accept and love me. But mm. my audience, yeah. uh, man, they're going to unfollow me. They're going to stop listening. They're going to unsubscribe. No one's going to buy anything. I'm going to be poor and broke for the rest of my life. That fear had power and consumed me. And so maybe six or nine months went by, and I was just like, I almost felt like at this point it was a duty and a responsibility. And I almost feel like because of my experiences, because mm. I was a, you know, a big former male, you know, white jock mm. that you wouldn't expect this. I never saw anyone that looked like me in sports growing up on TV talk about this. Um, and maybe if I did, maybe I would have been able to tell my parents. Maybe I would have been able to be, feel accepted. Maybe I would have been able to heal better. Maybe I wouldn't have beat myself up every single day that I was a loser and I was worthless. Maybe I would have had more peace in my life. So it became, it became this kind of nagging thing that was more of like a, a call, like I felt called yeah. to do something publicly. And again, I'm not saying everyone needs to like share their stuff publicly. I don't think that's the right thing to do or necessary, but it more felt like, oh, Lewis, this is part of your path. Yeah. This is part of your mission. And because it happens and because of your sports experiences and business experience, this is going to open the doors for certain people who have experienced that. Yeah. And I started to learn the stats that one in six men have been sexually abused. And I was in shock when I learned this. Yeah. 
And so I ended up doing a podcast about it. And I had someone interview me that I was a safe friend of mine that I think could, that I thought could guide me in the right way and make sure we did it correctly, that it was, you know, the right thing to put out. I got other people that I really respected in this space to say, hey, is there anything off here? Is there anything that I should do or not do? And I wanted to be of service. And I remember putting it out there and I, and I recorded it and I waited a few months because I was still living in fear. And then I finally put it out there and I came to peace thinking, okay, my business might be over. I might have zero followers tomorrow. I might, my business might be over. Because again, 10 years ago, no one had opened up yeah. about this stuff that I remember. And I put it out there and the opposite happened. You know, I got hundreds of essays and emails from men sharing with me for the first time ever about their sexual abuse. They never told a soul. And I was not asking them to do this, but I guess I gave them permission to do it. And um, it was emotional. It was extremely, emo I feel like I had an emotional hangover for weeks. Yeah, I've never been drunk in my life. I've never been on drugs. I don't know what that feels like but my body was aching, knowing that there was so much pain and suffering out there. Obviously, there's a lot of suffering for both men and women, but for the men that had never shared this, I was just feeling their pain and sadness. Yeah. And it's been a beautiful journey. You know, it's been a beautiful journey of, of me processing and healing. You know, it, it took a, a number of years for me to feel like I could tell anyone at any moment and not have an emotional or physical response yeah. in a negative way. So it doesn't mean it wasn't painful, it wasn't you know, traumatic, it wasn't challenging, it didn't hurt me, it did. But I've healed it, I've created new meaning around it, and I've used that meaning to be of service to others. And again, yeah. that is, as opposed to using the pain to be successful and prove others wrong, my mission is to use the lesson from the pain and be of service to help others overcome theirs. Yeah, And I think that's what we all have the opportunity to do. And we can all relate to someone in our lives and be of service to them through our pain, yeah. not because of our pain. And I think that really is why the book is such a powerful read, because it's not you theorizing. I wanted to say, here's my lessons and my experiences, what's worked for me. Mm. And then for 10 years, I've essentially gone out and found the research from the top, you know, doctors like yourself, mental health experts, therapists, neuroscientists, brain surgeons, um, energy yeah. healers, spiritual leaders, billionaires, world-class athletes. And I've asked them all the same thing. And I've gotten the research, the science, and the tools that are scientifically backed in pretty much every industry. Yeah. That just, okay, if you want to hear it in this way, or this way, or this way from these people, here's what I did, and here's what they're all saying, which is ex almost exactly the same in a different way. And then here's their research that backs this. Yeah. So I just wanted to make it bulletproof as opposed to here's my you know seven ways to do something from what I've learned. It's really, man, I've made a lot of these mistakes and, and overcome a lot of things, and I'm yeah. still overcoming and still making mistakes. And here's the lesson I learned from all these great people that back it with research. Does the story still have any power over you? I don't feel like it does, to be honest. I feel really at peace about it. And I, if someone wants to ask me about it at any time, I can speak about it without sadness, without, I have compassion and sadness for my five-year-old self, but I've done so much integrating work consistently to heal mm -hmm. and, and bring that quote unquote, little Lewis, five-year-old me, psychologically, yeah. emotionally, spiritually, into my adult self, into my current heart, and say, I've got you. You're safe. Thank you for overcoming and getting us here. Thank you for having the courage to deal with all this stuff that you had no clue what was going on. I'm so proud of you. You're, you're courageous. You know, it's kind of like having a a conversation with that version yeah. of myself that I wish someone would have told me at that time when I was so confused. But I didn't tell anyone, so no one knew. Yeah. And so it's me facing the past, which we must own our past if we want to have a powerful future. Otherwise, the past will, we will carry that past and that pain and those old stories that don't work for us. We will carry that yeah. into the future and it will only stay with us. That pain will stay with us. 
unless we face it, we turn around, we look at ourselves, and we have a conversation with self. We address it. We process it. Whatever healing modality or therapy you want to do, do it, and then go all in yeah. on that process. And this is not an overnight thing. This is not, let me just do a couple sessions and I'm good. This is a a lifelong journey of healing. Mm-hmm. And the longer you do it and the more intentional you are, the easier it becomes. Yeah. So I don't feel like I can speak about it at any time, like I'm having, you know, a, a cup of coffee with a friend, you know, talking about almost anything. Now, it doesn't mean it wasn't a challenge, but it doesn't have the meaning that it used to have. It doesn't have the emotional trigger it used to have because I faced it and I've been healing it. You mentioned earlier on in the conversation that you had a troubled relationship with forgiveness, forgiveness to mm-hmm. yourself, forgiveness to the perpetrator. Yep. How do you feel today? How is your relationship to forgiveness sitting right now? Yeah, I feel I, f- I forgave. Here's the thing. I don't know where this man is. I was, I was at a babysitter's after school. And it was the babysitter's son. So he was probably like 16 or 17. And I saw him a few times after that, but it was only a one-time experience. And I don't I don't know where he is. Um, I could probably go find if I needed to, but I don't have the desire to. So I've forgiven him emotionally, mentally, spiritually to myself uh, in the world, so say. And I don't feel like I need to face him or do something like that because I just don't think it's useful. Um, so I had to learn how to forgive him, you know, and he could be dead for all I know, but I had to learn how to forgive him. And sometimes there's people that hurt us that are dead and we still don't forgive them and we can't face them. So we have to learn how to mentally, emotionally, spiritually forgive people that have hurt us in the past even if we did, you know, even if they're a parent or something like that and we did love them, but they they treated us poorly yeah. or they did bad things to us, I think it's important to learn how to forgive. It doesn't mean you have to like the person, but forgive them so you don't feel the pain and the poison in yourself. And But I think that's the, the person that I needed to forgive the most was myself. Because then, once I forgave him, I, I realized, oh, for 25 years, I beat myself up with shame and essentially abuse myself emotionally, mentally. Like I allowed this story, this experience to define a part of me and then find other examples that confirmed that I was abused, that I was taken advantage of. I just find other examples of it and confirm, oh, I'm not lovable, This, I'm an idiot, I'm stupid, I, you know, all this stuff. And so I had to forgive myself yeah. for 25 years of pain that I caused me. And yes, there was other instances and experiences that happened that were painful that other caused, but I continued the beat up. I continued yeah. the abuse to me. And that's why I said if, if most people would record their thoughts and, and publicly broadcast it to the world, they'd put a lot of us in mental hospitals, me included when I was younger because of the thoughts I'd say to myself. And I, I had to forgive me. I had to forgive all that pain that I caused me um, and have compassion and yeah. accept myself and say, you know what? You know, it took you to your 30 to start this process. And I, and I even was like, man, I wish I would have learned this sooner. I wish I could have done this sooner. But that's not forgiving yourself. That's not accepting yourself. Yeah. So I had to just face it, accept it, forgive. And that takes time. It's Again, it's not an overnight thing for, for a lot of people. It's a... It's a grieving. It's a it's a grieving of a loss yeah. that you've been holding on to. It's a shedding of an old identity that you've been living for so long. That doesn't always happen in a moment. You might have a realization in a moment and a processing and an integrating of a new way of being and healing over a period of time. Yeah. Lewis, you've been very clear throughout this conversation and in the book that lots of different things can work. It's up to us to try and experiment yes. and find what works for us. Having said that, mm-hmm. is there one practice right at the end of this conversation that you'd recommend yeah. people consider? If you were yep. gonna give people one practice to think about integrating into their life, what would it be? Man, I mean, what I can speak for is my own experience. 
And I know other people have experienced different things that they think are amazing, but I don't want to speak for others. I did a, an emotional intelligence workshop that gave me an intense experience within a, a five-day window that allowed me to reflect and look at myself in many different ways quickly and to see how I show up in response with other human beings. And I think just doing this alone journaling is helpful, um, but I think needing to respond and react with other human beings is what we do in life. So learning how you react with others around you when you're triggered is valuable. So doing any type of group workshop of emotional intelligence, leadership training that dives into these types of things, there's a bunch of them all over the world, but one that I did was in LA. Um, and I think doing an intensive retreat style group workshop of healing is a powerful way to start because it allows you to dive deep, intense, quickly and, yeah. and, and face certain things. But I also believe doing one-on-one -on -one, like in mo emotional healing work with a really well-trained licensed therapist or a, an emotional coach yeah. uh, where you say, like I did this two years ago because I felt like I still had more things to uncover even though I've been on the healing journey. And I was still struggling emotionally in intimacy and relationships. And so I was better in life and in business. I was less reactive, but still in intimacy, I was struggling. And I realized I was the common denominator still. So I met with an emotional coach and I said, I don't feel peace, freedom, or clarity in this relationship. And my intention is to create peace, freedom, and clarity. And I said, I will do whatever you tell me. I will do whatever it takes. I will show up weekly. I will show up for three, five, seven hour sessions on Saturdays. I will do whatever because in a relationship, I was unable to create the peace, freedom, and clarity that I was looking for. And I didn't have the courage to exit the relationship because I still had a fear of people pleasing and things like that. And so I spent five and a half months every single week two, three, five hours sometimes on Saturdays, diving deep into my own emotional journey mm -hmm. in intimacy and relationships. That was after having the skills of meditation. Like those were skills that allowed me to get calm, yeah. but I still had to heal things within me. So meditation is great. It can help you get back to center. But the goal is to not be off center or have to get off to center because you're cultivating a state of peace and harmony consistently. And you're able to manage and navigate the stresses of life differently. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean you're not going to feel stress or challenge, but you should have the peace within you to be able to manage it differently. Again, going back to the orange, what's inside of you is what comes out of you. So just learning a meditation skill is great to try to get you back to baseline, but it's because you've gotten something inside of you that's pain and hurt. You've got to constantly like go on top with another skill as opposed to healing from what, the inside out. And so I did that for five and a half months intensely until I felt the pain. And I kind of had chest pains throughout this time because of a relationship I was experiencing. And I didn't know how to navigate my emotions mm -hmm. still in that experience. And there was a moment after five and a half months with a pain in my chest, it felt like a ball of my chest. It disintegrated and went away. And it kind of went all throughout my body. And I don't know what that was, but I haven't felt that pain ever since. And it wasn't like it happened, like it wasn't like I was healed in a moment. It was integrating and practicing and diving deep and facing it week after week for five months where it all finally clicked. And integrating it daily and practicing it in life is what I had to keep doing afterwards so that I could maintain it yeah. and and be that in my nervous system. And so that's um, that's what I did. But I'm willing to do whatever it takes yeah. for peace, freedom, clarity. And so I'm not saying that's the path for everyone else, but I knew that I wanted to be free emotionally because it was still holding me back. And um, it's been a beautiful journey. Lewis, I really, really appreciate everything you've shared today. I appreciate you taking the time to write the book. It's going to help so many people. The Greatness Mindset, unlock the power of your mind and live your best life today. I also want to just finish off by 
doing to you what I see you do repeatedly to your guests. I want to acknowledge you, Lewis, for your openness, your compassion, your service, the way that you have found greatness in yourself and the way you're inspiring so many others to greatness as well. Thank you, Lewis. We appreciate it. Thanks, Ring. I appreciate you, my friend. If that conversation resonated with you, here is another incredibly powerful one that I really think you're going to enjoy. That is one of the most important questions in this world right now. Are you living the life you want or are you living the life you've been programmed? And the answer, unfortunately, is most of us are living the life we've been programmed.